freaking first cut. Golly! Hello, YouTube. We are going down the memorial. Billy Horschel getting his seventh career PGA Tour victory. We will talk through all the players. We'll look ahead to next week, so make sure you hit the like button. Make sure you're subscribed. We'll jump into it right now. Welcome to the First Cup Podcast. I'm Rick Gaiman, joined by Greg Ducharm. Greg, hi. What's going on, boys? What a what a week in the game of golf. My goodness, it's uh, been something else. Yeah, lots of action and uh, more to come. Mark Immelman is here. Mark, good to see you. How's it, crew? Hey, who have you broke my one and done pick? Uh, we need to talk, please. Good grief. Yeah, oh, I'm not looking forward to that. That was basically the worst performance Cam Young's had in two months, I think. Mark, you found <laughs> Yeah, no. In um, two months, today, in two months, I, I've i never seen him do that. That's true. Maybe ever. <laughs> Golly, yeah, we, we, uh, we, we got out on the golf course and so I'm cruising along there with my group who sort of started a bit slow. And then um, I say to my colleague out there, Craig, my spotter, I'm like, check up on what Cam Young's score is. And he goes, dude, he's 11 over through 12. And I was like, what? what? And that was it. My day was ruined. Played his final six at one over, though, Mark. A little bit of a consolation prize. <laughs> yeah, awesome. <laughs> uh, gentlemen, Billy Horschel got it done. He went into the final round with a five-shot lead, and he wins by four over Aaron Wise. It was an even par round of 72 that got the job done. But, Greg... Billy did what he had to, you know, he made eight pars on the front and then he kind of stuck the dagger in with that 50 foot Eagle putt that he made on 15. It was exactly what he had to do to capture victory. Yeah. I, I thought he was really smart all day. Um, you, you look at where he hit the ball. It was always away from the trouble. Uh, it was to the correct side and it was a, it was a well orchestrated round for a leader. So I, I really enjoyed watching that. I mean, it, it's not the most exciting because the the chance of having a you know a really tight finish goes way down. But on a golf course like that, when it's really hard to make birdies and and the greens are as firm as they are, it's hard to get it close. Um, it, it was very well done. It was very very smart. But for the week in general, he was phenomenal around the greens. I mean, entering the day, he was a hundred percent scrambling. And that, that's been, I wouldn't say a, a weakness for him, but it was a really a, a big jump for him. I mean, for the year, he's 95th in scrambling. And for the week, this week, he's first. Uh, and, and what he did with his iron play was a, a real uptick in, from what he normally does, too. He was 140th entering the week, um, approaching the green, and he was 12th for the week. He was in proximity to the hole. He was 143rd for the year, and he was second for the week. So some really nice uh, performance increases for him. He kind of revealed the game plan to Jack Nicholas on the on green side there at 18. Mark, he said, fairways, center of the green, two putts, and make somebody come get me. <laughs> yeah, it's the major championship equation, isn't it? And and this week, especially over the weekend, it certainly was major championship-esque, you know, with a rough that was cut last Thursday. The stuff wasn't topped off. It's they, they cut the stuff Thursday. Then we got some rain earlier this week, and then they just let it go. They didn't even top the rough ups off, so it was like six inches plus in spots. Greens are firm. Uh, yet to, the fairways were running fast, and so it became a situation where you had to sort of play out the fairway. And we saw situations with guys like Cam Smith and company where if you drove the ball in the rough, you were really going to struggle. And then um, I covered Horschel Saturday afternoon, and he put together that round that was, for me, one of the best rounds I've seen this year. Just the control you know, he hit balls in both directions. He made very smart decisions. You know, the golf swing was in supreme working order. And so you have those days. And then what he did to me was what you always, what I should say, always expect, is that under pressure, there might be a slight downtick in form. And because of nerves and anticipation and all these sorts of things that go alongside winning, especially an event of this magnitude. And, and, and I thought he played a very calculated, very smart round of golf and, and sort of took his chances where he could. Uh, we heard, I mean, having Jack Nicholas in the booth over there is just so enlightening because you get to speak to him during breaks as well. And and he was just glowing about how Billy sort of took the rough and the smooth and saved when he had to. And, and Jack said, look, he was great yesterday and he wasn't so great today, but he did what he had to do. 
and Billy did what he had to do today. Didn't have his best stuff, but made putts when it meant something coming down the stretch there. And and in the end, got himself a, a big enough win that he could uh, lead, I should say, that he could sort of enjoy that very special walk uh, up 18 there at Memorial. Yeah, he kind of made a good bogey out of the back bunker at 12. He made another one out of the back bunker at 17. Those could have been bigger numbers, but Billy gets out with bogey, which was certainly plenty uh, in those situations. And Greg, we talked about this earlier in the week, but let me rehash now the PGA Tour winning resume, or at least let's do the worldwide tour or the worldwide winning resume for Billy here. It's so bizarre, right? He's got the two back-to-back -back playoff events, including the tour championship, which ends up also being the FedEx cup. He wins the Zurich classic twice, once as a single, once as a partner with Scott Piercy. He has the match play victory and he has the BMW PGA championship victory on the European tour. So this to me very clearly kinds of outside of the FedEx cup. I mean, th this is this, this is the big time OWGR strength of feel like this is the stamp on the resume. Uh, yes, absolutely. But I will say, I mean, some of these other victories, playoff victories, um, the match play, you got a great field there to beat, obviously, although it's a little unique, they're all big time events, right? The flagship, uh, the flagship tournament on the European tour, the DP world tour now, uh, in, um, at Wentworth. So it's really, it's really impressive. I, I find all those victories impressive. I would say the, the Zurich, the individual Zurich was the one that was a little, um, probably the weakest of all of his victories, but at the same time, I would agree. This is his, this is his biggest win and it's on a golf course. You might not expect a, a Billy Horschel to win on, um, even though he, he can play pretty well on tough golf courses. It just it doesn't seem like this is the type for him so i was um kind of surprised i guess uh and and the other thing too rick you know you mentioned why why is this one hard for him to win you look at the guys behind him and really until you get to denny mccarthy i mean they're they're great ball strikers aaron wise is a, he's known to be a ball striker patrick cantlay is a great ball striker joaquin neiman max homa will zalatoris those are the kind of guys you expect to have near the top at least in their style of play where they're really solid ball strikers. And Billy is a nice ball striker on certain golf courses, but he doesn't seem to be, um, you know, the iron player that some of those other guys are. So he, he stands out a little bit on this leaderboard to me. He is the only guy to win the Zurich as an individual and as part of a team, he's gotta be the only guy who's won the BMW championship and the BMW PGA championship one on each side. I find it hilarious that the European tour version is the one that has PGA in the title, which is kind of weird. and doesn't make any sense. Norm normal sport type stuff there. Um, but, but Mark, it was a really cool scene and I'm not sure if you were able to kind of capture it out there. You know, he's walking up 18. He knows he's got this thing in hand and he's got the whole family in tow. The, the, he's got to tell the kids on 18 green, Hey daddy just won. We pulled it off and uh, they're quite excited about it. It's kind of what you dream of. Really, there. And, and then just to, to come in on Greg's observations there, um, I've been fortunate to be around for a couple of Billy's wins and to call them. And I called the win in Cherry Hills at the BMW, um, where he, he came in there after coming up short. He had an opportunity to win the Northern Trust or at that stage, the Deutsche Bank the week before up in TPC Boston. And these are all different courses. You go from the Northeast, you go to Colorado, um, Denver for Cherry Hills, and then you come back to Atlanta for Eastlake. Three different environments, three different time zones. Then you play here in Ohio. And, and and I see a guy, he's played well in Texas, um, down there in, in, in San Antonio and Hill Country. And so I see a guy who's from Florida, but the game really mm -hmm. traveled. And then you get blue chip guys that contend week in and week out and such. And and Billy is sort of that guy, you know, when he was in college, he wasn't a world beater, but he beat you. He was just all grit and uh, he, he was all desire and all hard work and everything about what he does is all in. And then there were always the guys who were slightly better, but he would always find a way to compete. And so he's that guy that, you know, when he swings the club, you'll pay attention. When he hits the ball, you'll pay attention. But he's just not going to blow you away with statistics. But when he plays and when he's in contention, he's going to find a way to win. Doesn't matter where it is. Doesn't matter what the golf course is. Doesn't matter what the, 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 uh, the examination is. 
if he's contending, when he gets himself in there, he will not back down. And that speaks to the mental acumen of the man. And, and that, I think, is one of his biggest strengths. And for my money, yeah, maybe statistically it doesn't show it. But the guy is very reliable from tee to green. I, I, he's built himself into a good putter because that was – it used to be the weakness. And, uh, and you saw today a guy for all seasons. You know, he was virtuoso on Saturday. Not that great today, but he still won. Yes, he had a big lead, but he earned that lead. And then he sort of withstood some fire and fallbacks from players. And then also a little tri tribulation. And and I look at that par he made there on 13. I mean, that was just mammoth. And that sort of speaks to who Billy is. He hits one poor tee shot, uh, kind of unfortunate, and makes that big par save. And that allowed him to sort of build from there. And then that putty hole down 15, it was that's mind-numbing stuff. Uh, I could go and put you guys, anyone over there from that spot, and you'd put it straight off the green. I had Joaquin Neiman just a few holes before, and he ch he was there short and chipped it up there nice and close. And I caught up with him briefly walking down 16, and he goes, man, I didn't want to be above that hole. But this is just who Billy is. He's the guy that sort of is a statistical anomaly because if you watch him play, you would think the numbers would be better than what they are. And and the resume is put together already is, is glittering, in my opinion. Yeah, basically the worst swing that he had all day Maybe the tee shot at 15, Greg, that causes him to to drop the club. Well, it ends up in the middle of the green or in the middle of the fairway, and that's the hole he ends up making eagle on. So things were things were certainly going well for Billy Horschel, who will now move to the 11th ranked player in the world. And Greg, we talk about this all the time, and most of the time we shouldn't, where we're like, oh, this is going to be a Presidents Cup conversation. This is going to be a Ryder Cup conversation. He just earned a lot of Presidents Cup points, and I mean, he is he is now firmly in that mix, I would imagine. Yes, I would agree. Um, and and he's he's earned the privilege to be in there. I mean, this conversation happens so often, but typically it's when he has a good performance at the match play. And I think there's a there's a difference between being a strong match play player and being a really strong player uh, and, and, you know, having a great resume to back it up, especially in the year of a, of a team event like this. So I think this will go a long way. I, I also, you look at some of the other golf courses he's had success at this year already. One of them would be the API. Um, he had a really nice run in um, on, on the West coast swing with the farmer's insurance open. Uh, he played great in Phoenix, the API, as I, or, as I mentioned earlier, and now this one, these are some big time golf courses. And uh, Mark, I wanted to ask you this. Would, would you, um, would you put any parallels between Muirfield Village and Quail Hollow? They seem a little, I mean, I know the grasses are different, but they seem similar in style. You're on mute, Mark. Excuse me. Both of them are, are defined by driving the ball well off the tee. So you got to do that well. And they're typically Jack Nicklaus. Um, I know Quail Hollow wasn't designed by Jack, but, but Jack's theory, and I, I asked him about it, he said, I like to give guys room to drive the ball. Now, this week, there were some very narrow fairways, but largely around here and at Quail Hollow, you can go ahead and hit driver. And then from there, you've got to be a decent iron player to contend. Um, Rory is, you know, in his day at Quail Hollow is unbeatable. And and it's the kind of place where if you're a big hitter, it's advantageous. advantageous. So I can see the advantages uh, and the comparisons. But I would sort of say this place to me is is very much kind of what, like one of those northeastern type type tracks and i see a whole lot of augusta national here even though it's got the bent grass and that sort of stuff. so it asks you to drive well, well to really get, get good iron shots mm. billy horschel seventh career pga tour victory now firmly in a lot of other discussions as well I want to talk about some of the guys that were in the chase back, made some moves on Sunday, but first we're going to take a quick break and hear a word from our partners. And we're back. Aaron Wise, solo second, four shots back at Billy Horschel, nine under par. And Greg, this is kind of what Aaron Wise has been doing. He's been a noted, phenomenal top 25 tee to green player for the last couple of years. It's the putter that has been a massive issue ever since he went back to that broomstick style putter. He's been great. He gained five strokes putting this week at the Memorial. That's the type of stuff that is going to eventually get Aaron Wise back into the winner's circle. 
Yes. Um, and now in DFS, we talk about Aaron Wise. All He, he every, rates out well every week. I, right? I it's constant. <laughs> so he keeps popping up as one of the you know top guy in any, any kind of model that you run. So that draws a lot of attention in the DFS community. And it seems like there's a little bit of a, you know, people roll their eyes at him because he always comes up and you should always play him. And, 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 that, and he's kind of chalky in a lot of ways, but this is what's been missing, right? Not just, not just what he did on the greens this week. Um, but he has like a, a, a pop iron week. He's been a great iron player, a great TD green player, but leads the field in proximity to the hole this week. I also found that interesting. It, it's rare that you see the, Top two guys on the leaderboard, also top two in proximity. Um, just it, it, that's kind of a useless stat, but I, f- I found it rather interesting. So this is a great week for Aaron Wise, and I hope it brings a lot of confidence to him. Um, it, it's probably going to make him even a little more chalky in all your DFS lineups. But um, but it, it was really cool to see. It was cool to see what we've been playing for so long. For the last month or so, we've been waiting for this great putting week, and we finally get it, and it leads to, you know, a second place finish, a, a really respectable tournament for him. And I thought he was great today too. I really, he was impressive. He didn't quite go on the run that you needed, but it didn't look like it was a um, a, a shaky Sunday round because he was in contention and not used to it. Yeah, he was two under through 11, so he was certainly hanging tough, and he finished uh, one under 71. And Mark, Aaron Wise, I think, is the perfect intersection of, like, you and I. I you know, looking at the data, looking at the eye test, I love it when a player identifies something in his game, makes a switch, or starts telling us, hey, I'm working really hard on this one facet of the game, and then you start to see the numbers reflect that. That is always what I love to see and Aaron wise as of right now is the perfect example of that. Uh, yeah, look, I've always been very, very impressed with him ever since I watched him play in college. And then when he came out on tour, I, I was there in Vegas when he contended and watched him play up close. And I, I think if the look, I think if there's a weakness and I hate to speak about a guy's weakness, who's a, a really sound young player, but if there's a weakness, I think he could even know what the statistics say, he could take a leaf out of Justin Thomas's book. And watch how JT flats irons and JT controls distance with trajectory and speed uh, where it looks like to me that that Aaron was sort of has one speed and that's the foot on the gas the whole way around. And I think if he does that, well, I believe I should say that if he does that, then he's going to be able to maybe short side himself once or twice less because he's so close right now that it's not like, well, I'm going to improve my game. It's just about shaving that one stroke at that one opportune time when you're in the final group kind of thing. And that's where today there were one or two opportunities when Billy was against the ropes that Aaron would sort of spill one. And so, and, and that's the first thing I would say is sort of less short sides because you pick shots and hit different types of shots to targets. And then I feel like he could really iron out the play out of the bunker. And that's also one of those things. And my colleague Ian Baker Finch mentioned it. He goes, if he just had a bit more variety out of the bunkers, um, you know, you basically see him go wide open face as hard as he can all of the time where the real stars around the greens, the speeds and stuff, they'll do different things depending on what the shot is requiring. And I feel like when he does that, then there's going to be that one situation where perhaps he short-sided himself, that he gets out with a miraculous save, other spe- a speed, and then he starts to turn all these positive and trending performances and, and numbers and stuff into really um, eye-popping finishes because that's all he's missing right now because he drives it great. He swings it beautifully, in my opinion. He just varies some speed, you know, learn to to kind of lay away from the fastball some and shape shots a bit more. And and then he might, I mean, he has the potential to perhaps be a Justin Thomas of sorts. And and, and I see many, many comparisons, many sort of comparisons between those two. Yeah, he's a he's a grinder too, man. He's he's not in Vegas anymore, but he used to spend all day and all night at Summerlin, just like on the putting green. I mean, it's like I know all these guys do and they have to, but it's impressive when you see it up close and personal. Let me add another voice to the conversation. I believe we have him. We've got him. There he is, Kyle Porter. KP, what's up, bud? Oh, the first the first, the first the thing first I hear. Thing I hear. Uh, get on is Mark saying, "Well, I know what the statistics say, but here's what I'm seeing, which is just." <laughs> Just chef's kiss good. So thanks for that intro, Mark. Uh, hey, did you did you pay attention to what I was saying there, big boy? Uh, 
Yes. Yeah. And I heard somebody doesn't fight their irons like JT, which is literally every other human on the planet. Yeah, but I'm saying that if you watch Aaron Wise play, I feel like he's got that gear. If he starts to just investigate down there, you know, just lay off that fast. Well, that's, that's all it takes. Change work in the uh, the off speed stuff, the change up, the the slider, the curve. Let's see what else you got there, Aaron Wise. KP, uh, we've covered Billy, but I'd be remiss if I didn't give you an opportunity. Would you like to talk about uh, Billy Horschel and his seventh career PGA Tour victory? This one from out in front. Yeah, I, I, don't, have, I don't have a ton on it. I think it's interesting that he hasn't um, he hasn't won a ton of like big time events for somebody who's kind of consistently a top 15 top 20 guy in the world you would have thought that i mean he hasn't so his three biggest wins in terms of strength of field were bmw in 2014 uh match play last year and this and so you could argue this is his best stroke play win in eight years and he's just kind of a he's an interesting guy on the tour because he doesn't contend in majors right he's got one top 10 ever i think um, and he doesn't really win big time tournaments or he hasn't in the last eight years. And so this felt, it's weird to say that like the 15th ranked player in the world was like winning was out of nowhere, but that's a little bit what it felt like to me. Um, even though he plays like really consistent, good golf all the time. So I don't know. He's a, he's a, he's an interesting guy. He might be on the, the uh, president's cup team now, which I think would be super intriguing. Um, that the president's cup team is going to be. I mean, it's, it's insane, like the number of guys that they have to choose from. But yeah, it's a great it's a great win for him. And I, I think it's a I said this on HQ. I think it's a I don't know if it's a springboard for his career, but it's something that I think really validates the consistency with which he plays at and has played out for a long time. Speaking of major championship and lack of contending, Greg, Patrick Cantlay is going to get me again here. Because he just finished T3, 72, 69, 69, 71. Patty Ice is back, baby. And the next time we're going to see him is Brookline. What, what, what in the world are we going to do with this guy? <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, I guess just wait until wait, wait until travelers. If he's I am Wild e, Wild, what's his name? Wiley Coyote. And he's the road runner and he just disappears in a tunnel every time. I don't know. I, I can never nah, get it. I, I totally get it. it it's uh if you, it's interesting if you look at what he does for the year, can't lay. Um it's it's really good. But there are these areas of disappointment and letdown. And so the general public gets in these pools or plays DFS or or you know, gets in uh involved with a couple of bets heading into majors. And then, and Cantlay always looks really good. Always. A any way you slice it. If you use your eye test, if you look at statistics and numbers, if you look at recent form, it feels like heading into every major, he's a top priority and there's a letdown. And I, I just, I'm not surprised that he finished tied third this week at all. Um, but I'm, I'm no more confident about the U S open. This is exactly where we always have been. And to be fair, I don't think there's anything he could have done this week that would really change my mind on that and make say, oh, this is going to be a great U.S. Open for him. Because the truth is, we just don't know if we're going to get his skill set to come to light in the major. Uh, and, and that's the difference. It's, it's not that he can't handle majors. There's nothing lacking from his game. It's just a matter of, is he going to bring it? Uh, and I, I always feel like that's the hardest situation to handicap and predict. Well, it, it's kind of inexplicable too, right, Craig? It's it's not like like he's so good and his skill set almost makes more sense for majors than it does for regular. Yeah. Like it, it would be one thing if you had uh let's just say Tony Fina out there just just bombing all over the these PGA tour courses. And then when he gets to majors, he if he he doesn't really struggle at majors. But if he did, you'd be like, well, that sort of makes sense because like his skill set is just hitting it a long way. That doesn't maybe work at certain major course setups. But Cantley like literally does the stuff that you need to do the best uh, at majors. He he's like as good as anybody in the world. And then he it doesn't translate. It it feels like a mental thing. I I, I don't know. I mean, you, when when you're when you're dominating at places like Muirfield Village and and uh, I, I don't know what his record is at Riviera, but places that 
again, are, are courses that require major championship like skill sets. To me, it feels like a mental thing when you go to majors that you're not performing as well as you do at, at regular PGA Tour events. If I might just add to this, I had him, his group today after my penultimate group kind of went in the tank early. And when Patrick Cantlay, in my opinion, is at his best, he can hit this little sort of just a slightly held off that just drips off the top of its flight and falls right. And when it looks to me like he's struggling, it looks like he's fighting the ball going left. And and today I thought he did a mammoth job of keeping himself in the game because I saw a number of balls where the thing would launch a little left, I believe, of where he was intending and then start drawing. And they would just sort of catch the edge of targets and go in the right direction. And so I feel like he's turned the corner. You know, it looks like he's going in the right direction. He had his coach, uh, Jamie Mulligan, out here this week, um, who incidentally has started working with Francesco Molinari. So watch out for that. Um, and so it looks to me like he's going better, but it's still just not there. And I look forward to seeing him now when he gets to Brookline uh, in a similar sort of situation, hilly, heavy, rough, small, firm greens, if he can get that little fade shot back. Because there's one thing about a ball that's turning left. It's not the hook that's going to kill you. It's the fear of the hook that's going to kill you. And if you watch Cantlay, more often than not, he's sort of underneath the hook shot a little bit, and he hangs one off to the right, and you can see the body English trying to hold the thing on the target. And he kept it alive today. So when you say skill sets... He showed me major championship mindset and grind today. He wasn't like just far away free swinging. That was not the case with Cantlay today. And he cobbled together a very good score. So from that point of view, I feel like, you know, he can contend. But when he's at his very best, he doesn't hit the shape that I saw him going with today. Well, spoiler alert, in nine days on uh, Tuesday, June 14th at around... 1 p.m. Eastern time, I'll be saying, oh, Patrick Cantlay picked a win for the U.S. Open on this show because I will certainly uh, fall right back into that trap. Oh, how about this one? Max Homa, Greg. Max Homa set a record this week. Do you have any idea what record Max Max Homa set a record? It has never been done before. He made a bunch of birdies, didn't he? It is not birdie related, although I guess could in some way relate to low score um i nope. i don't know i have no idea <laughs> 99 putts for the week that is the fewest wow. number of putts in tournament history 100 was the record done one two three four five six seven times max homa snaps it off doesn't even need triple digits 99 that's huge I mean, good. he really could have been right there. He he has been playing some beautiful golf, and when he is putting this way, uh, he is extremely dangerous. Doesn't happen very often, but when he does, he contends. Well, I tweeted I tweeted this out. I, I think he's a top ten player in the world right now. I'm open to arguments, but I think I think Max Homa is one of the ten best golfers in the world. I don't right think now. you're going. I don't think you're going out on a limb with that. The way he's right. swinging, the way he's yep. been playing. Uh, you know, I, I'm on board with what you have to say there, but it's a very fluid situation because you've got a bunch of guys like John Rahm, for our argument's sake, is not playing anywhere close to what he's capable of. A number of them get on a perennial friends there. Uh, I feel like they've got a little going to go, but right now I'd, I'd agree with you that he is. So um, where would you compare he and, uh, or how would you compare he and Will Zalatoris? Uh, I mean, Zalatoris is, is <laughs> that's tough. I mean, you, uh, Zalatoris needs to win, right? Like Max wins. Yeah. He, he wins yeah. a lot. Uh, I think Zalatoris, so my problem is if you start going down the list, I'll have like 28 guys in my top 10. That's what I was trying to get you to fall into the trap. <laughs> <laughs> I think Zalatoris. I think Zalatoris might be in it as well, though. The, the I ask because I find it very interesting. Like it, when you first say that, I saw your tweet earlier, and I was like, "Well, you know, the there's something missing, and it's uh, which is fine. Everybody, most players have something missing, but it probably a you know the performance in majors. Yeah, yeah. And but but now Will Zalatoris has a great performance in majors, great unbelievable record, but no wins. 
so I, I was curious how you would kind of reconcile that because I find it interesting. I, I, I'd, like, I'd love to add to this because I've got, been fortunate to cover them. And, and throughout my career as an instructor, I would always grade a player by how good they are when they don't have their best stuff. And I would say if you're comparing them uh, that situation, I would give Homer the edge because his golf swing's a bit more reliable. He hits a more penetrating shape. He's, de he's better on and around the greens. Now, Will Zalatoris, when he hits it, and I watched him for 36 holes at the PGA Championship. I came out of there with my eyes just wide open because the guy is just incredible ball striking wise. But you feel like you get the sense always that there's always one that's just likely to go off on him crazy. And if it's not a wide shot off the tee or a bad iron shot or maybe a bad decision, then it's something on the greens. And right now, I just feel like Homer is a whole lot more steady, a whole lot more consistent. So if they're both struggling, I would give the edge to Homer. Now, when they're both at their best, they're both really, really solid. So I would say Homer just by, by a nose right now. Greg, this is obviously not the only thing, but I was looking at, um, for Homer, I was looking at uh, ball striking over the last three months. Mm. And he is fifth in that in that period of time. Uh, Cam Smith one, Rory two, Hovland three, Zalatoris is 10th. So I think you make the argument that, and again, that's not the only metric. You have to look at a bunch of different stuff. Like, uh, JT is not, huh? Wait, 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 wait a second. You're telling me Cam Smith is first in ball striking? That's right. Good golly. He couldn't keep it in Dublin, Ohio this afternoon. Yeah. Well, was, it it's three really months, bad. not one round. Yeah. He's really Fish. bad off. And he's been awesome on approach. It's also not updated through Memorial. So, um, okay. And it's not the only metric because, like, JT is not in that top 10, and JT is one of the 10 best guys in the world right now, obviously. Right. So, I think you have to take a bunch of different stuff into account. But I think, I think Homer and Zalatoris are both in there. Throw, throw a couple more at me, Craig. How about this, Jacob? Do we have the updated? Okay. Jacob is the man. He has the updated. OWGR after the memorial. This is from Nosferatu on Twitter. Here is the current top 10. Scotty Scheffler, John Rahm, Patrick Cantlay, Cam Smith, Colin Morikawa, Justin Thomas, Victor Hovland, Rory McIlroy, Sam Burns, and Jordan Spieth. So, Kyle, who is out and who is in then? Uh, well, I, I thought he could just add on. He said 28. He's right? just going to so add. Wait, what is Homer ranked in the world? 23. 23. Okay. That's a lot of people to jump. It's a lot. I think, I think, is Homer better than, um, oh, this is hard. He's better than Morikawa right now. Agreed. Let's define yeah. right now. Well, right. that's the, that's the thing. It's like, okay, is it a month? Is it a week? Is how, about it this? how about this? If we were playing, an event tomorrow, who would you want type of deal? Yeah, that's that's a good way to define it. And I would take Homa over Morikawa. It'd be I fair. Agree. Yeah. It'd I be don't fair. I mean, he's he's on fire and he's putting great. He's putting great. What four? I mean, four good putting weeks in a row now for him. The ball would, striking that you already alluded to, Kyle, been awesome. I, I would take him over Victor. I might take him over Cam Smith the way Cam Smith's driving it right now. Uh, so the hard. amazing thing about Cam Smith is he can contend at least for three days at, at Muirfield Village driving it the way he does. It's just he's, unbelievable. He, he's a magician. Would you take him over Rory? I think Rory's an interesting one. I think I'm I, I think I think I think I'd probably I, take Rory, but it's at least a debate. Let me save yourself from yourself. You wouldn't. Don't do that. Really. Can't do that. Rory's don't had do a bad round in months. Don't do don't do what? Don't take home. Don't, don't take don't, home don't take home over Rory. Don't do it. Well, he just beat him in two of the last three tournaments they played. <laughs> okay. Do your thing. I would... <laughs> Well, I mean, <laughs> what are we talking about here? Are we talking about so, so the sick the sick part is like it's actually hard when we're looking at the OWGR because Rom has not been that great, but I can't like he's second on this list and I can't I can't drop him. Obviously, John Rom is in the top 10, but he's not playing up to his level of golf that you would expect. Well, 
yeah, Rom's weird because he's still like finishing top twelve in in like all these events, but he it feels horrible because he played so good at the beginning right. of the year. You're like, man, Rom sucks right now. It's like, oh, he just finished in the top twelve in like seven straight events or whatever. I, I don't know what the numbers are. So I yeah. think, yeah, I think Homa and Rom probably take. Uh, I probably take Rom, but I, I think I just. I think with Homa, I and we don't need to do this all day, but I keep going back to like he is he's made a leap from last year to this year and he continues to make these like in, uh, kind of incremental leaps, but this year he's he's playing he's hitting the ball like a top 10 guy in the world. Whoa. And you yeah. see some of the finishes that are a result of that. And and I think that I think there's a little bit of a uh, stigma around him of like, oh, he's the Twitter guy. Like he's funny. He's and, and and I get it, but he's. I think we need to just acknowledge like he's playing top ten in the world type golf right now, um, and it gets a little bit, I think, buried by everything else that surrounds him. I think we can agree that he is better than the 23rd ranked player in the world, which is the way he is being ranked right now. That's for sure for Max Home. He's been absolutely awesome. You know who else has been awesome? Min G Lee, Greg. She got it done. That was another multi-shot lead going into the final round. You don't know how a golfer is going to react to that situation. And she said, don't worry about it. I I got it. I'll take it from here. Lowest 72 hole total score in U.S. Women's Open history at 271, and that second, the second major championship victory. The first was the Evian Championship just last year, so she's on quite a quite a good run. Uh, and e even this year, it's been really good for her. best on the LPGA Tour in scoring average, uh, most rounds in the 60s, second in official money. She won earlier in May, so she's been on quite a roll. And, and um and you could you could see an event like this coming and she's she puts herself in the mix a lot so she um and she hasn't in u.s women's open um she she hasn't really contended in one of those yet until this week but um but very very comfortable with the lead very smooth swinger um, and clutch on the greens she made a lot of really clutch power putts today yeah uh, which she I did. Was, that was that was big it reminded me almost of and and the golf courses look so similar, but when Martin Keimer won the yep. U.S. Open, he kept having these eight, ten foot par putts, and he he made them all. And it, that's the difference. That's exactly what it reminded me of. I, I actually watched more of this than I did Memorial on Sunday because I wrote about it for CBSSports.com. And I mean, she reset. It, it was I thought it was kind of it, there was some cool symmetry because she she took the fewest strokes in U.S. Women's Open history. And she made the most money at a women's golf tournament of all time. I think it was 1.8 million. And uh, she was, it wasn't an exciting event because it was a little like, I mean, Keimer was the one that I thought of, Greg. And I think it's probably just because, you know, Pine Needles, Pinehurst, they look very, like on TV at least, they look very similar in terms of um, the green contours and kind of the shot around the greens and stuff like that. But um, to do, I mean, she, it just, the, the tournament was never in doubt on Sunday. I watched most of it from like the fourth hole on and, you know, she just didn't, she didn't really, it, it just never felt like she was going to lose the golf tournament, which is as we've seen at majors and tournaments over the last month, not the easiest thing to do. And uh, yeah, it was, it was super fun. She was awesome. I thought it was cool that in her interview afterwards, she said, this is the one that I've always wanted the most. And I don't know that you always, I think on the men's side, sometimes you hear guys say like, I just wanted to win a major, you know, and, and, and this one really stood out uh, and stands out. I think on the women's side is the one that most professional uh, women want, do want to win the most. And, and it was cool to hear that from her. Yeah, pretty good, pretty good parallels to to Billy Horschel's day as well. It was, uh, I mean, it was fairways and greens. It was make the putts you have to make. I actually thought Minji was more in control than 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 Billy was. Mark, she had the full facet of uh, of skills today. Rick, I've been fortunate to get to watch a number of great golfers through my time, and I and I'm really really lucky. And, and I'll tell you one thing: I want to go and watch Minji Lee play golf because, as far as I'm concerned. This woman is golf royalty. 
and her and her brother, their family are massively talented. Min Wu is great. Uh, he's just kind of raw. But Min Ji, I think, is poised for a major, major championship run right now because she's won two of, I don't know what it is. I don't keep much, uh, keep much of an eye on the LPGA. Maybe I should. But every time she's on, I'm interested. And when I got home from work this evening, I turned on the television and waited to do this. And I watched just the thing close and, and just everything about her game, just I'm attracted to it. Um, the way she carries herself, the way she swings the club, the way she answers questions. She, she's just the ultimate professional. And, and I feel like she could potentially be the next superstar if she isn't already on the LPGA. And that's exciting. And I'm keen to see where she goes from here because this huge win could do one of two things. Either it just lets her lower the handbrake and go, or maybe she starts to try and play up to who she is right now with the expectations, the personal burden that one places on oneself. But I feel like it's 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 more of the former with her, and I look forward to what the future holds now. Yeah, super, super special stuff. Keep an eye on Minji Lee moving forward. Gentlemen, we've got to do our best bets. We've got to do our one and done. we got to do a quick news roundup. But first, we are going to take a quick break and hear a word from our partners. And we're back. Uh, let, me, let me hit this best bets real quick. Then we'll do the update. Then we'll end with the one and done. Because I can be quick on the best bets. Coach and I lost. Morikawa top 10. I had Seamus Power top 20. KP, you went with Xander Shoffley top 20, which is seemingly the lockiest lock of all time, where he will be in between 12th and 18th every single round of the golf tournament. He will never contend, and he will finish inside the top 20. It's straight cash, homie. Straight cash. I did have uh, my... my uh... My matchup was Homo over Zalatoris, which was just tough coming down the stretch on Sunday. Homo, I think, bogeyed, what, two of his last four or something like that? Maybe maybe just one bogey at the end. Uh, Xander's final round, Greg, was his best his best approach round ever and, like, the fourth best approach round since the start of 2021. Maybe, maybe, maybe more, you know, good. I mean, he's obviously been awesome. Like this is, this is a great strategy. He's been great. It's just, I want to see him in the mix. I know you never get to watch him. I thought I was looking at his numbers coming into the week and thought he was a, a great play, a really safe play. I, and I thought maybe this week would be a week we get a pop out of him. Uh, and it just hasn't happened yet, but I, I would be, fairly confident that at the country club he's going to be around his record in u.s opens is so good and his form right now is so good i just wish i got to watch him on tv a little bit more he get himself in the mix yeah. i wish i could i wish i could bet maybe you can bet that he's going to finish between third and 11th at the u.s open yeah i, I love that area <laughs> it's we'll all our guys in, at caesars and make a special uh a special prop for us Xander please do it i will <laughs> yeah Next minute. I, I need some extra money to pay Mark and coach off. Uh, what would the uh, number be on that, Rick? I mean, it, it's almost not even worth worth betting, I, right? I don't know. An exact finish you should be able to get pretty good a good number on. Go ahead, Mark. Hey, to that, Cal, I appreciate you saying so. Do you guys need my Venmo handle? Because the only guy that's paid me from the PGA is coach. Are you guys going to sleep? That's tough. I thought I did. I apologize. I'll do yeah. it right. I'll do it before we get off the air. Uh fast carries, fast friends, huh? Come on. By the way, Mark, um, I looked this up. Rory and Homa have played seven of the same tournaments this year. Mm -hmm. uh, Rory's finished ahead of him three times. Homa's finished ahead of him three times, and they tied once at, at Riviera. So and if you want, <laughs> if you want, for sure, yeah, the tie tie goes to the Northern Irishman is what I've always heard. <laughs> um, and then if you want to go strokes gain, uh, ball striking, Rory's one point five and Homa's one point four five. So they're essentially the same, the same golfer so far in 2022. Good stuff. All right. Uh, all right, gents. Let me officially declare this RBC Canadian week, which is also London Live Golf Week. And the news coming out of yesterday uh, that we didn't get a chance to talk about, Mark, is Kevin Na uh, very slyly resigning from the PGA tour and the Twitter lawyers, the Twitter lawyers have explained this to me, Mark, they have said uh, it's basically like retiring. So it kind of ensures, or at least in his opinion is more likely that he gets his pension, his PGA tour retirement stuff. If he just says, ah, I'll just resign. I'll just retire. 
from what I understood, because obviously there was a lot of conversation off the air at dinners between CBS announcers, and from what it was explained to us that his pension will remain just all the donations to it or all the uh, contributions, I should say, they just suspended. Um, personally, I'm not so sure why he did this. Uh, why not just kind of take a chance, you know, go and play one time and maybe see how the chips fall down the way because there's a number of guys whose names um, I don't think have been released just yet who might play that also have not done anything with a tour just yet. So he was fast in the draw, and it's almost like that situation where with Phil, I feel like he was going to be kind of at the front of the line and saying, well, I'm going to take all the bullets and run some cover for the folks that might be coming up. So it was an odd decision, but you know what? These guys are entitled to do what they want, and if he wants to go and play for that money and not necessarily his legacy, go for it by all means. I mean, you're your own person. You can do that kind of deal. Now, for someone else like I had a brief chat with, burger on the range this soft this afternoon before play he's like why would they do this uh, he goes really do we need all the money is what he basically said to me and so it, it sort of for me just kind of highlighted the conundrum of the thing is like are you going to just go play for big bucks in a shotgun start where you might be ending on the fifth and so and so is ending on the 18th and you tied and the fifth is way harder than the 18th and and no one knows what's going on till they count up the scorecards afterwards it's going to be laughable initially um but again there's certain players from my experiences this week that are like okay you really want you really need the money and, and that's kind of my response to it that's why? that's why they don't call him db straight cash homie they call him db straight live in kp they do that's <laughs> that's good uh <laughs> The shotgun start is sick. It's whole, it's it's unbelievable that we're we're cover. We're, I mean, I mean, I'm gonna have to cover. We're gonna have to talk about this and write about this at least the first one. I don't. It's amateur hours, for goodness sakes, man. And uh, how can you do a shotgun start event for this amount of? Now I'm gonna get back to the money thing. Well, there's, there's okay. millions of dollars on the line, and you're finishing on 17, and I'm finishing on one, and we're tired. This is not not right. That's stupid, though, Mark. They're gonna they're gonna obviously reset after the third round and put the guys who are in the lead going off number one first. Yeah, but again, Rick, there's difficulty of holes and stuff that's brought to bear, and I might start on the 17th and get a run, and all of a sudden I'm tired. Yes. I'm tired, and then I go through the hard stretch holes, which those guys have played already and lost some strokes. Uh, come on now. It, is, we gotta go, we gotta go to strokes gain now instead of instead of uh score to Lord, par. Lord help me. I'm gonna check out you guys. I'm done. I, I can't anymore. That'll be that'll be the the new leaderboard is strokes gain. It'll be the actual it'll be like the real leaderboard. The first league that goes to to just strokes gain has my full commitment. T same i'm i'm in uh <laughs> that's when i'm finished i when when we start giving out awards for strokes gain this, i'm like uh -uh, i'm gonna go check out i'm gonna go and uh, i'm gonna farm with louis west as no well, we we do give out awards for strokes gain you guys do no oh. B billy horschel had the most strokes gained at the memorial we gave out a bunch of money and a trophy for the most strokes gained very um, true. what, what I was going to say is, I forgot what I was going to say. What, what were we talking about? You were talking about burger. I had something else I wanted to ask too. And I, I also forgot Kevin Na resigned trying to keep his pension. Oh, okay. So the reason somebody brought this up, it might've been Eamon Lynch brought up thinking that Na resigned as a sort of, um, like trying to get out ahead of the major championships because the thinking is that if you are not a member of the PGA tour, you can't be suspended by the PGA tour. And then if you're not suspended by the PGA tour, there's no suspension for the other organizations to uphold when the majors roll around. Right. So like it's going to be more difficult for the US for the USGA to suspend Kevin Na for the U S open. If he's not suspended by the PGA tour, because that's sort of what they're, they, they would just be like, recognizing the tour's suspension by saying, well, Kevin, now you can't play at Brookline this year because you're actually suspended by the PJ tour. Now that he's not part of the tour, he's not suspended. So the, the U S open doesn't, I mean, they can still like not let him play, but they don't have as solid legal ground, I think to stand on as they would, if he was still part of the PJ tour. I heard this afternoon from a somewhat reliable source that the USGA will not be doing anything 
in terms of suspensions from Brookline this year for the guys that go and play in London. Now, again, this is from someone else. Don't quote me on this, but that's what I that that's what I caught wind of this afternoon. Which I think is super interesting because it's going to give the Ricky Fowlers and f- whoever freedom to be like, yo, like if the USGA and RNA don't care, why don't we do this? You know, why don't we get paid a ton of money like DJ did? And if you don't care about the Phoenix Open and the Memorial and Riviera, and I think some guys do, a lot of guys probably don't, uh, then, and, and you can still play in the majors and you can justify where the money's coming from. That's a lot of ifs. Uh, it, I think it makes, I mean, I, I'm not a proponent of it, but I think for that person, it makes sense. I think there's a reason that like DJ doesn't care about Riviera and Muirfield village and Bay Hill. He just wants to get paid and play in the majors. And that's what he's trying to do. And if you don't like living under par, Greg, right. That's part of it too. PGA tour, like <laughs> live under par. The other thing uh that i've heard speculated is that there were some guys in the field this week at the memorial that are going to be going and we just haven't heard it yet greg so i don't know if there's going to be more names because we are now one two three like four days away from this london event i've heard um well i i heard that there would be more resignations like kevin nah from the tour Hmm. we'll see how that plays out um but uh, to the in I don't know if guys are going to go more guys are going to go this week. I'm sure some, this is going to happen, gonna happen. Uh, more often. Um, but a couple thoughts on the majors. If, if there's any legal question about what you need to do here, then the safest play is to not do anything and allow them to play. And for Kevin Na specifically, he eventually will, will play his way out of the top 50 in the official world golf rankings because the live events don't have, world golf ranking points so maybe yeah. you allow him to go qualify for a u.s open um so you know you might be in your sectional qualifier your local qualifier perhaps um 18 holes at a local club and you're paired with kevin Na. uh that you know who knows that might Sick. happen but the when you have a dustin johnson who's a an exempt player in majors for uh, and one of them in particular for the rest of his playing career that's where it gets a little dicey a little iffy so i'm very curious to see but but if everybody what i learned with the kevin nothing is if everybody decides to resign then we're not we'll we may never know the punishment you'll you'll never know (laughs) they just thought they just he was gonna do greg do you think we're talking rick and i were talking about this on on whenever it was wednesday do you think that kevin not can cobble together enough owgr points from the majors and like four asian tour events to stay like to to be able to play in the majors because you can play in the asian tour events i presume i i would be surprised if they didn't let you i'd be very surprised um mm-hmm. how many of those are you going to be willing to play in right what what's the what's his motivation because when you make this move it it seems like the, mo- the motivation is strictly financial uh and you've heard some other players mention the schedule and how it's nice and relieving um, but he also he said a couple of things in his statement that had nothing to do with money, even though we know that that's what it's all about. He talked about having playing opportunities elsewhere. And I uh, aside from the PGA Tour and aside from the PGA Tour, I can't think of any other playing opportunities that these guys have missed out on. Uh, none, none of them, except maybe the Saudi International, where there are big appearance fees this year. Um, was there ever a, a question? as a tour player. So you, you've traded, you know, a, a, the opportunity playing opportunities in probably close to 80 events between the DP world tour and the PGA tour for eight. Uh, may, and then maybe what the Asian tour schedule is. So I don't know what it, I don't know how much he's going to try to get into majors by playing on the Asian tour. I, I don't know. It doesn't seem like those two things would go together. It's going to hinge on, I mean, Rick and I already discussed this forever, but it's going to hinge on the OWGR board, right? Because if, if they start approving, and I don't, I, I don't know what, how this works, but if they start approving live events, then guys will be like, okay, I'll, I'll go do that. And I'll make, you know, 
four X what I would have made on the PGA tour and I'll still get to play in majors. And some guys might do that anyway. Cause they don't, I think, I think a lot of players care, don't care as much about majors as fans like to think that they do. Um, they do care about making a ton of money, you know, in their profession. So I don't know. I'm intrigued by it. The first event is going to be just a, it's going to be a, a circus and it's going to be comical, but it's also not probably as, funny as people thought it would be two months ago because the number 13 player in the world is headlining the event like that's a real um i don't know if it's an issue but it's it's not ideal for the pga tour dp or all these other tours that are trying to fight against uh a rival league kind of taking over their territory yeah just pivoting because i'm going to try and figure out the YouTube so I can watch this on Thursday morning. <laughs> Friday. And, 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 well, Friday. Uh, yeah, 54 holes. Forgive me. Right. Uh, that's not, it's almost not an official event on the PGA Tour. Here's my question, right? So if most of the folks that are playing, most folks watch the YouTube, uh, you crowd and younger, like my daughters. Okay. And, and then you get a bunch of old timers in the twilights of their career going to play for millions and millions of dollars. I don't see the compute. Why would young folks want to turn, tune into YouTube and go and watch a bunch of old golfers where it's more kind of my, in my genre of player that's going over to play there. So it, it doesn't make any sense. And I'm really keen to see how, because of the side of the industry I'm in, how the whole broadcast goes about things. Cause I know the producer who's doing it. I know of one or two announcers that are going to be doing the show there, but I'm just keen to see what this is going to be like. It's going to be like watching a European tour production show on golf channel on Thursday morning. Or is it going to be like a real slick buttoned up operation? So I'm, I'm keen to see, because remember, this whole event, its front doorstep is how it's portrayed and how it's broadcast. Now, I'm getting promoted messages from Live Golf on Twitter, for Pete's sake, saying, you must watch this event. And I'm like, really? Are you guys trying to gin up it, support that much? So I'm keen to see now how the first one goes because yes, it's likely to grow because they'll just throw money at people and money is the greedy is the equalizer in this, in my opinion. How does this get portrayed to the golf fan? Because apparently this is good for the for the game. Remember, that's what Greg's telling us. What's this going to be like to watch? Norman, so, not Ducharme. Uh, yeah, sorry, not you, Greg. Important. That's an important. Uh... So, so, so there's so there's my question. So that's the that, that's what's fascinating to me right now. I just don't like, is anybody going to like, I, we, I have to watch it. it. Yeah. I'm going to watch it. Yeah. But for the, not because you're like, you know, genuinely watching it, you're, you're watching it as a sideshow. Like, is anybody like genuinely interested in Richard Bland teeing it up with burned Weisberger? That's my point. Yeah. I wonder what percentage of casual, golf fans who watch the PGA tour on Saturday and Sunday afternoons, even know this exists. Very few, yeah. very few. In my opinion, you've got to live on Twitter to know that this thing's happening. I kind of agree with that. I, I kind of, I kind of agree with that too. And I think it speaks to the, the fact that the Saudis just, they don't, they don't care how many people watch it on YouTube. Right. It's, yes. Now you're getting that. But, kind of, but yes. I mean, what, what do you think is, uh, Kyle, what do you think is their purpose in this? Of the whole league? Yeah. Well, I think it's, I mean, it's what Lee Westwood said a couple of weeks ago of, of normalizing their country through sport. Right. So, and, right. So if you're going to do that, don't you need an audience? Don't you need people? It needs to be a big deal. I mean, they're not, their purpose isn't just to give big name players a lot of money it's this not is, to, in, okay well so in world, I, this is a big deal but it is one cog of one spoke of the wheel it's f1 and it's golf and it's movies and it's television and it's wwe and it's all of this that when you add it all up and everyone goes oh saudi arabia maybe i'll go on vacation or, oh that's not a bad place they've got all these events there in our golf world it's huge it's massive in the larger scheme of things it's one more thing that makes the regime legitimate and i think i think what's interesting about that is is none of the events are e even in saudi arabia <laughs> like they're in the united states right so that's kind of weird i think jacob brings up a good point and this is what he's chatting with us behind the scenes but he said this 
the, he said the purpose of this is to entertain businessmen that are in the top 5% of the world's wealth. I don't know if you wanted me to read that out loud, but I did. Uh, <laughs> in the same way that you don't, you don't sponsor a golfer, like you're not a company that sponsors a golfer because you want a million people to see your brand on a Sunday afternoon on the PGA tour. You don't care about that. What you do care about is Rory McIlroy being spot. Well, Rory's a bad example because he's not sponsored by anybody, but Colin Morikawa being sponsored by your company and then coming to an event where you can bring clients uh, that can interact with Colin Morikawa and do deals with your company. Right. And so I think, what Jacob is saying is that that's the same kind of concept that's happening here uh, with Live Golf. Is it, it doesn't matter if a hundred million people watch this; it matters if the right two hundred people care about it and maybe have an experience inside the. Ro They're selling inside the ropes uh, tickets, so so like maybe maybe that you know I, I I don't know I don't know like what the end game is, but I I don't think it is necessarily the stuff that we tradition like the metrics that we traditionally care about uh, you know what? I, I, I want to say this real fast just to the inside the ropes things if you poll 30 pga tour players the leading guys the guys that the live folks are after and you say to them list for me the aggravating things at events they will tell you stuff like that happens at the pga championship where you have 50 folks inside the ropes um, who shouldn't necessarily be there. And it's like all in sundry walking along, getting in the way of stuff. And then you're having to do that. And then you add to that all the television cameras moving around to try and get around these people to broadcast this thing. If you start having a bunch of folks inside the ropes there, these folks they're trying to attract, you're going to have to start giving them a whole lot more money because there's there's a lot of things that go unwritten and unsaid in this. And, and that's going to be an aggravator. Okay. 13 grand if you want to walk inside the ropes with uh, Kevin Na for the next uh, three days. So, <laughs> the blow. Um, all right, we'll, we'll put a pin in it there because I imagine I, I think we're going to get more announcements on Monday, honestly. It's like what I think is going to end up is going to end up happening here. So we'll obviously keep a close eye on what's going on in London. But, gents, we've got to do our one and done update. Uh, Sia Najad has continued his mush, and this time it extends to me because we both had Colin Morikawa and I fully blame Sia, not Colin for this zero dollars that we both received. Kyle Porter, you had Nito Pereira, 221K. I think you should have, you should be pushing for Albatross bonuses in the future. If a golfer you pick makes an Albi like Mito did on Sunday. Did he yeah. make a two? What's yeah. That? I didn't honest. see that. You get an extra hundred k, something like that. We should have we should have worked that in. For sure, that sounds like something Commissioner Coach would would be all about. You guys are trying it all right now, aren't you, Rick? Yes. Good grief. Uh, I feel good adding, about. We're adding feel, the golf events, Mark, to the schedule. Yeah, man, I hate this. <laughs> I, yeah, we should. That would be sick. I I I mean, Peter I have, Uline. I've already used Kevin Na, but I I've got some other guys available. <laughs> I. I feel good about 220 for Mito. I would feel better if it was November and not, you know, the beginning of June. But yeah, 220 for Mito is is good. It's one of his better. It's got to be like the third most money he's earned so far this year. I would think second or third, fourth maybe. I would agree with that statement. Cam Young, uh, both Mark and Greg. Greg, I'll start with you because the 26,640 that Cam Young got you after shooting an 80. Was it 84? 84. Apologies. 84. And I hate that for you guys. I hate to see that for y'all. Really? Got 84. Also, Cam Young got 84. <laughs> the other is, is, that, that allowed the fans to leapfrog you. No, they leapfrogged me last week. We already discussed. Producer Jacob seems to think that's not true. Well, I, I remember having this conversation about getting leapfrogged. <laughs> Maybe it was two weeks ago and I passed them. And we've been nose and nose, but I'm pretty sure they leapfrogged me last week. But all that being said, did he get hurt? Well, I mean, what? <laughs> yes. I, I, what happened? I don't know anything about. I didn't know if you guys heard anything about it, but he shot 84. Well, okay, if, this guy. If I can shed some light on this, Greg, <laughs> I had him for a little while yesterday, Saturday. 
And, you know, he hits it hard and he's got a lot of leg drive, a lot of body rotation and stuff. And to me, you know, it's a sliding cut, but it looks like it could easily get out of time, you know, where he gets out of sequence pretty well. And it looked like he got a little late in a few shots. So there were a few balls hung right, which is the miss. And then he pulled a few off that. And then when you start having a two-sided miss around uh, Muirfield Village, it's long days. And then you get on the wrong side of things and you make a bogey, then you make another, and then you suddenly try and force the issue and you attack a flag you shouldn't. And then that turns into a double. And and that's kind of what happened. I, I heard he, he missed a wedge on five in the water on the par five. And so stuff just started going sour in a hurry. His his scoring average for the year is sixty nine point six. He's seventh. He's seventh on tour in scoring average. He shot eighty four. He shot eighty four today. Uh, you know what, Mark? I know you took him too. I I'll take full blame for this. Um, this is clearly on me. Yeah, but the truth of it is, if think about this, if if I if I'd called you up on Thursday and said how are you feeling about your pick, you'd be glowing and going, yeah, my boy's in good shape because he was five under. I think think through the first day. It's just on what Saturday I was I was feeling pretty good about it. Yeah, it's it's just golf. It is what it is. This sort of stuff happens, and you just you know pack your bags, you go to the next stop, you do your laundry, you get some good practice in, and then you tear it up Thursday and you see what happens. Cam Young had a birdie on the card, a par, a bogey, a double. He did not make a triple, happy to say, but he did make a quad. Uh, so full full day for Cam Young out there at Muirfield Village. The fans got 303,000, uh, which Jacob, uh, you also got 303,000. John Rom. Now, that was their selection by landslide. Their second pick was Cantlay, who would have got them a little bit more, but they weren't close there. Their third pick was Cam Young. So they did have three guys basically in the mix for a long time. They did have a good little selection there. I mean, you do hate to see that they didn't take Patrick Cantlay. Uh, really feel for him. Unfortunately, our man, the coach, took Patrick Cantlay. So he jumped ahead of me, which is pretty brutal. I mean, I feel like I've been making solid picks lately. They just haven't been turning out. But as as Mark says, that's just golf sometimes. You know, I had Cam Smith at the PGA. That's why I didn't pay you, Mark, because I thought we were given a discount for guys who led strokes gain t to green because i know you respect that metric so much um but i i finally paid that off to you so <laughs> congratulations uh you know coaches coaches now in second place in the league but you know what dale earnhardt said second place is just first loser so really we're all losers compared to mark right now i'm well we'll hopefully get them by the end of the year maybe have you moved the end of the year date yet, Jacob? Uh, I feel like there's probably something. When does the, the uh, when does the live series? I mean, mm -hmm. I still got I still got DJ Kevin Na. I mean, I'm pretty sure I haven't used Graham McDowell. I'll have to double check. Um, Richard Bland definitely is still in the cards for me. So, I mean, you might throw a live invitational series into here just for the fun of it. Yeah, there's a lot of there's about to be a lot of amendments and extensions and uh, rule changes that we're going to vote on. There's going to be a lot. Of, I just a lot of things in the works, Mark. The the problem with Liv is they're not going to have strokes gain data, so that's going to give Mark a huge advantage over us. <laughs> what are you guys going to do? <laughs> yeah, that'll, that'll, Mark's going to go into a sunshine his sunshine tour connections, considering like a third of the league is South African. So he's going to yeah, he's going to get some deep they, sleeper picks. They, they, was it you or maybe my spotter Craig who texted me and they're like, big guy, a lot of the South Africans are going. And I texted back. I was like, yeah, well, um, when I spent some time, there was a bunch of us who got together for a cookout at the PGA on two, the Tuesday evening. And a lot of them said to me, they're like, Mark, we can't get into European tour events. We're playing in Japan. We're playing in Europe. Uh, like Dean Burmester, for argument's sakes, was 69th in the world, world ranking, and he couldn't get into stuff. So he's like, it makes a whole lot of sense for me to go and play because of the money we're earning. And then you multiply those dollars into South African rands, and you you styling, you really you vibing if you do if if you uh, Daniel Berger. So I I, I was it could really be Dean vibing. Dean Burmester DB straight vibing the new DB straight vibing straight cashing yeah <laughs> uh, yeah how am I supposed to know how Richard Bland finished T forty three was he relying on the short game did he not make any putt I need to know. <laughs> I mean, surely a well-run operation like Liv will have the, the courses lasered, right? <laughs> They're already every, every every round's on YouTube, so 
theoretically the camera crew should be oh. at every hole at all times so round by or Why? shot by shot video scrape it scrape should that be, should be good we'll just uh we'll just self-plot it ourselves that, that'll be a good exercise oh. for um all right gents anything else before we get out of here memorials in the books we're headed to canada and apparently london anything else before we get out going once going twice sold dfs preview monday for the rbc canadian open tuesday make a preview pod round by round recaps coming along the way producer jacob does all the hard work behind the scenes mark immelman available at mark underscore immelman that's great through charm you can find him at the real gfd kyle porter available at kyle porter cbs and you can find me at rick run good this has been the first cut we'll catch you next time <laughs>